Hi, my name is Tyler Stallings. I'm the director of the Frank M. Doyle Arts Pavilion. For this uh, special film project called Almost Presidential, this is something that's happening in the fall of 2020, uh, leading up to the uh, U.S. presidential election, um, November 3rd. And part of doing that project was thinking of something that was timely. And this is an exhibition that really follows on a long history of artists looking at social and political events and responding. And for me, as a director and a curator, I've always been fascinated by how the arts offer an opportunity to really open up you know, questions. It creates a platform um, for other people to participate and to look beyond uh, the categorization and the uh, you know divisiveness um, that can occur. It's it's through the ambiguity you know of the arts um, that all these questions can occur. And I think with this particular project, almost presidential, uh, it's a group project of six artists, and they each, in their own way, focus on a single subject, a single person um, who may have had a political office or who may have been aspiring for a political office. And I think what's interesting by that is it's kind of the famous feminist art uh, slogan um, of uh, the personal's political, meaning that when you look at the kind of individual details of yourself, of the daily life, or of other people, you begin to see how uh, the world's events are being reflected in what they do. And it's sort of the idea that small gestures can have large ramifications. My name is Marissa J. Fudernick. I'm an artist and a writer uh, based in Los Angeles. And I'm one of the co-curators of the project Almost Presidential, along with Rebecca Sittler. My name is Rebecca Sittler, and I also go by Rebecca Sittler Schrock. And I am an artist and a uh, professor of art, and I live in Long Beach, California. We initially met because I had gotten an email announcement from, I think, Human Resources of a book tour and book event that you were doing as part of a, a recent book that you did about uh, presidents. And so we kind of connected. It's very rare, I think, to find someone else who is both an artist and has visited all of the presidential museums across the U.S. and who has these kind of interests in history and in presidents. So it was um, kind of nice to initially connect that way and then through we exchanged books. And not too long after we met, I was at the Richard Nixon Presidential Library in Orange County and the curator there told me about another artist who had made work related to presidents, Deborah Ashheim. And so we reached out to her and the three of us got together and that was really the start of the conversation for what's become the Project Almost Presidential. The Project Almost Presidential is about failed candidates and political failure as well as vice presidents. And so the title Almost Presidential is a reference to this notion of individuals who almost became president and didn't because they lost an election, or individuals who served as vice president and were close to that position of ultimate power, but not actually in that position. We also wanted to talk about this idea of failure being a really important part of the political process in the U.S. And I think it's often it's often not discussed, right? There are no museums of political failure. Usually these candidates are kind of reduced to one-liners or stereotypes or caricatures of an entire and heavily invested race and, and platform of ideas and, and things that were brought into, uh, really into, into kind of political conversations. So we wanted to kind of take the unexpected route and go with those candidates that maybe did not um, win a, a major presidential election. Almost Presidential highlights artists whose previous bodies of work have challenged the visual and rhetorical representations of former presidents and their legacies. And in the run-up to the 2020 U.S. federal election, this project involves 
um, six artists who've made work either about vice presidents or failed presidential candidates. Though our national histories are often writ written with victors in mind, failed candidates have a substantial impact on really intangible ideas that surround electability and how we visualize presidential power, slowly but gradually expanding the political imagination of the electorate. Additionally, the platforms and strategies of future candidates and political movements are influenced through ideas that may gradually gain momentum and reach consensus in future elections. We also need to acknowledge the current moment and how that relates to this project. Uh, we all realize that many of the former candidates that we're going to be talking about in our, our artworks um, and these past elections seem rather quaint in their general sense of civility and that many of us are probably yearning for debates that offer more of a genuine discussion of ideas and of platforms. And so you might find yourself longing for a time when there were shared assumptions about a peaceful transfer of power. And even though disenfranchisement, of course, always existed, a time when voting was, was largely respected by all candidates as essential to our democracy. These histories both contain small seeds that have grown into this current moment that we're living through, as well as the possibility of imagining our way out of it. Uh, presenting a timely exploration of political rhetoric, failure, gender dynamics within political systems in the U.S. and beyond, as Tyler mentioned, including Mexico and the Philippines. All of the artists in this project combine fiction and historical fact into an active survey of political material and text and image. Five of the six artists from the project are able to be part of our conversation today, which we're thrilled about. Uh, along with Rebecca and myself, we have Deborah Ashheim, Matthew Brannon, and Cynthia Segovia. We'll each take a few minutes to talk about the work that we made for the project. And we'll also talk briefly about work by Pio Abad, who unfortunately can't join us today. I'm gonna start by talking about the piece that I made for this project, which is titled Concession. And that feels like an especially uh, prescient uh, word to be considering. This project was conceived as an installation. So you can see here um, a, a test installation of how it would be shown if it was in a gallery space. The project consists of staged photographs in which I don a paper face mask to assume the identity of a dozen different failed presidential candidates, nearly all of them male, from Barry Goldwater, who we see here up through Hillary Clinton. And as you can see, the photographs uh, have text panels that sit alongside them. And each of those small green text panels um, are, are typewritten texts that weave together quotes from actual concession speeches, along with fictional lines that I've written. This is painful, and it will be for a long time. This was never any child's dream. Biggest mistake I ever made. But no. Tears, blood, vomit all at once. Hyperventilation. The words come out of my mouth. I still believe in America, and I always will. Frizzy hair, melting makeup, sweat stains in my pits. Doesn't matter now. Donald Trump is going to be our president. My mother, crocheting a peach baby blanket, slices of pizza and pitchers of beer that first year of law school. No one likes a smart girl, the professor tells us. Bunions and calluses. Remember, any boy can become president unless he's got a mustache, Dewey tells the Boy Scouts. It has happened. It is done. Your hugs are not enough. So we had Barry Goldwater in the beginning who lost to Lyndon Johnson in 1964. Then Hubert Humphrey, who lost to Nixon in 68. Here we have George McGovern, who lost to Nixon in 1972. Uh, we've got Walter Mondale, who lost to Ronald Reagan in 1984 and John Kerry, who lost to George W. Bush in 2004. 
and the other John, John McCain, who lost to Obama in 2008. Of course, Hillary Clinton, who lost to Trump in 2016. The previous um, failed presidential candidates, they were all the nominees of their party. They were all major party candidates. Um, George Wallace is an interesting case and especially someone to be considering in our current moment. He unsuccessfully sought the Democratic nomination three times, and he also ran as a third party candidate in 1968. And he received 13.5% of the vote. So he's the most recent third party candidate to receive pledged electoral college votes. Um, he's notorious for calling for, quote, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. He's a, the governor of Alabama. And he also ran on a campaign of law and order in 1968. Um, the echoes of which can certainly be heard in Trump's 2020 campaign rhetoric. And so for me, he was an especially interesting figure to think about in the context of these other failed candidates. Um, he also, he ran for the Democratic nomination in 1972, the same year that Shirley Chisholm, who was the first black female Congress person elected, uh, ran for president, ran for the Democratic nomination. And so here you can see a poster for Chisholm's campaign. And on the right, this is a photograph from the 1972 Democratic National Convention. And these are George Wallace supporters and Shirley Chisholm supporters uh, seated near each other on the convention floor. So it, it's remarkable to me that, um, that these two really extreme uh, size of the coin in American politics were both part of the Democratic National Convention that year. Um, and Wallace was actually shot at uh, Point Blank Grange on the campaign trail that year in an assassination attempt. And Shirley Chisholm uh, visited him in the hospital and she was actually really criticized for that gesture. Um, but she expressed the belief that in a democracy, it was important to respect your opponents. The alternative, she said, would be to encourage, quote, the same sickness in public life that leads to assassinations. So I do find myself, as I look at this body of work, as I look at this peace concession, really thinking a lot more in, in recent days about Wallace and about Chisholm. There's something about what gets lost to history and what gets forgotten. And I think one of the things that we've all been trying to do is, is to cull some of these things that have been lost to history and reevaluate them, especially in the context of 2020 and our current political situation and the upcoming election. Hi, you guys. I'm Deborah. For my project for um, Almost Presidential, I chose to focus on JFK and um, Richard Nixon, which are two presidents that I've been obsessed with my entire life. And in a sense, they aren't failed presidents because they both were president, but they also were the two modern presidents whose terms were interrupted and not completed. You know, Kennedy famously, of course, by a bullet to the head and, and Nixon being the only president to resign. Um, and so I just want to play you very quickly a little clip from a newsreel footage. Uh, there's one hour that happened in... Um, on November 14th, 1960, after um, Kennedy had narrowly, by a very, very small margin, beat Richard Nixon. Um, and Nixon, who was the sitting vice president, was meeting with Kennedy to, for a uh, peaceful transition of power. At Key Biscayne, Florida, Vice President Nixon awaits President-elect Senator John F. Kennedy for a post-campaign meeting, which Mr. Kennedy arranged to restore the cordial relationship between himself and Mr. Nixon of 14 years standing in Congress and the Senate. Both were reserved about details of their hour-long talk. Despite earlier rumors, Kennedy would offer Nixon a post in the new administration. Um, so I became obsessed with this one hour. The idea of this peaceful transitioning of power, this lovely meeting, Nixon gives Kennedy a book, you know, and they both talk about it, um, and they shake hands, and they, um, 
it's like it's so inconceivable to me that it seems like it's like a, a fan fiction from another planet or something. But so I um, a lot of times in my work, I've um, I dive into historical archives and try to as completely as I can understand a very short period of time, maybe a day, maybe 36 hours. In this case, it's really just an hour. But I just drew the best images that I could get from the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and then other ones that I exhaustively searched for online. And I was trying to just embody the idea of this meeting. So we think of Nixon as old and decrepit and Kennedy as youthful and vigorous, but actually they were only a few years apart in age. They had a lot of shared background. They were both officers in the Navy. They had served together in, the, in Congress. They were reported to have been friends, like not really friends, like Kennedy's friends that he used to go out like sort of carousing with because Nixon was a strict Quaker and he didn't drink and he was against like dancing and smoking, you know, but they were they were closer on a lot of issues. They were both cold warriors. Their main concern was um, defeating communism. And after Nixon lost to Kennedy, um, you know, by a tiny, tiny, you know, like by the kind of elections we have now where it's almost contested who won at the end. You know, he, had, he went into these sort of wilderness years and, and that was when he ran for governor and lost and said, had said his famous thing, you won't have Dick Nixon to kick around anymore. So I got really interested in what would the, the, like the emotional tenor of this very restrained, very civilized meeting have been? Of course, now when I look at these drawings, it, it just seems impossible that I could have even lived in a time period where there are people who are still alive that remembered this um, afternoon in Key Biscayne. Um, in 1960 and also are, are you know, are, are watching what's playing out right now. Like it, it's, it's kind of mind boggling to me. So I've done many projects about um, Nixon and, um, and I also did a, a project for called Kennedy Obsession. And the, I chose Eugene McCarthy primarily for his footnote role in the Robert Kennedy presidential race against um, when he was running for president in 1968, which was also cut short by an assassin's bullet. But um, the reason Robert Kennedy ran for president or didn't run earlier, he didn't want to challenge Lyndon Johnson, who was the sitting president. Um, and Eugene McCarthy entered the race as the anti-Vietnam War candidate, basically forcing um, Robert Kennedy into the race. Um, and because John that's what made Johnson say that he would not seek the nomination again. One of the important things that we are able to do as artists is to shine a light on something, be that a uh, forgotten history, uh, an underrepresented part of history or figures from history or ideas. And the work in, in Almost Presidential is very much doing that. So it, it's really bringing to light issues, figures, ideas that are maybe a little bit neglected. And that's something that we can do as artists. In addition to the actual nuts and bolts day-to-day -day work of voter engagement, of letter writing, of showing up at protests, of donating to uh, causes that we're passionate about and, and putting in labor that way as artists too. And I think artists, you know, have, um, have sort of uh, the time and sort of the ability to kind of look at history from different angles and to also look at um, even ephemera and elements of history or even like the traces of history or archives in a different way. Um, because all of that material is incredibly rich, right? We're used to having it all narrated for it for us, but it's quite messy. <laughs> it's um, it's sometimes incoherent, um, and I think artists are often really driven to to exploring things that are maybe more human about this about this process, or or that are maybe messier <laughs> um, than often history uh, wants us to believe it is. Thank you for having me today. Uh, and I'm really happy to be included with this group that not only do we share an interest, but that we make art about that interest. <clears throat> and I th think this is just the beginning of a larger conversation, but the piece I wanted to show today is this one here. It's called Political Pressure, Political Vacuum. And it's essentially two sculptures uh, that I can co-join through their title, but for the last seven years I've been uh, doing research into the American war in Vietnam. And so I have a kind of unresolved uh, ambitions of whether I uh, leave the art world and sort of try to get a uh, degree as a, a transnational diplomatic historian, or if I 
continue to make art about it. But this here is a cement vacuum cleaner of votes. And I made this um, thinking of just how the four year election cycle has a, a, a massive influence on how it is that the US conducts its foreign policy. But I wanted to pair that with this other piece that I made, which is a fictional convention pin for Ronald Reagan. So I was born in 1971 and the cultural horizon for which I lived my entire adolescence was dominated by this one person who I think his shadow exists today, but it was not, uh, I think for my generation, we don't think so far back when it concerns Ronald Reagan. But I just wanted to read this quote from uh, June 16th of 1968. This is from Ronald Reagan. Uh, when asked if he was the only hope for the conservatives in the Republican party. And he said, I won't go along with using those labels. I've been working for two years to get the party to drop the labels. And I think we've been successful. I think there is a different philosophy or belief in the Republican party today at the grassroots level and on up through the pros. I think you'll find that a Republican is far more willing to see good than other Republicans. In the interest of winning, there is a great desire. We have had our bloodbath and learned a lesson from it. The party was virtually out of existence just a few years ago. So uh, I think that kind of condensation of political parties, which were, I would say, were suffering from these days, uh, had some... Uh, seeds that begin at this point here. Um, Ronald Reagan was actually uh, far below uh, Richard Nixon to win the uh, uh, the convention, but he was actually his number one threat in that um, they, they knew they weren't going to give the nomination to Rockefeller, and there was a moment where they thought Ronald Reagan and Rockefeller could join against Nixon, uh, which didn't happen. Uh, and what have happened. But anyways, I made this, I use a lot of the typography from, from, from uh, film posters that uh, Ronald Reagan had during his career. But <clears throat> when we initially started this conversation, I began to do research into George McGovern from 72. It's another side of backstory to the Nixon narrative that's happening. Um, and that middle bumper sticker now is on my Volvo and <laughs> I wonder as I drive around if people can read between the lines. But I think that, you know, there was a portion of the population that couldn't imagine McGovern not winning the election. And of course, uh, Nixon won by an incredible landslide. This recent series of photographs that I've been working on as part of this uh, collective or project is called Fritz, uh, fragments from an imagined presidential museum for Walter F. Mondale. It includes images of constructed still lives that explore Mondale's failed presidential run while also suggesting that his candidacy changed the way that we think about the presidency and about presidential campaigns. Uh, to make these artificial museum displays, I make paper replicas of objects and ephemera, and I arrange them in a kind of a constructed diorama in the studio that then I photograph. These images follow a book of, that I published in 2014 titled All the President's Men that combined images made in presidential museums across the U.S. with photographs from my father and grandfather's homes. The book block is surrounded by a large panoramic image that opens up to reveal replicas of objects from my dad's memory box and a story that he often told me about a chance meeting with former President Harry Truman after an all night road trip when he was only 18. I started this particular project on presidential museums because I was fascinated with the Nixon Museum and its fusion of the domestic, the political, and the nostalgic, as well as the museum's attempts at balancing representations of Nixon's very public failures, while also attempting to elicit empathy from visitors. The book and series took a look at the way that presidential campaigns and the museums that represent them can replicate particular types of mythologies surrounding masculinity, even when they might not accurately reflect the men that they depict. Um, I was drawn to exploring Walter Mondale as a political figure for several reasons. Uh, I was drawn to his respect for and ability to see the value of supporting roles. So he really expanded the role of the vice president during the Carter administration, and he allowed also Geraldine Ferraro, his VP pick, to play a, a much more um, sort of dominant role in the campaign. 
And in the series, I play with um, similar elements of nostalgia, collage, fusions of the domestic and the political that I observed in presidential museums. Uh, I also use scale, repetition, cropping, or highlight details to ask the viewer to look at a kind of familiar representation in a different way. And I am also really drawn to looking at the visual and rhetorical devices that are used to communicate particular subtleties of changing notions of mis Midwestern masculinity in particular, and how these can affect presidential campaigns. Um, for perhaps obvious reasons, I was also drawn to Mondale's challenge of facing a populist incumbent. He was up against Reagan when he was running for a second term in 1984 um, for this image. I was also thinking about Jackson Katz's book, uh, Leading Men, that proposes that most presidential races are shaped by and are a referendum on competing forms of masculinity. And uh, last but not least, I was also drawn to Mondale's support of women and the Equal Rights Amendment. He chose a female running mate in 1984, Geraldine Ferraro, who was the first woman to be chosen as vice presidential candidate by a major party. Um, for grounding his VP, um, he often reversed conventions of campaign imagery. So a lot of images from this campaign, you actually see her place kind of in front of him. I think he also understood that this would be a historic re election regardless of the outcome. Um, so even though he lost the election, I think he really helped to expand our notions of what a president and vice president could, could be. Um, and while in hindsight, these shifts may be somewhat, uh, somewhat subtle, maybe frustratingly so, um, they do lead to larger seismic, seismic shifts in our political landscape. Um, so the ephemera that I chose, um, because I've done previous projects that relate to history, gender, and politics, I collected ephemera from uh, presidential, failed presidential campaigns um, with uh, female candidates. And my favorite sort of piece of ephemera here, um, which is this pamphlet for Margaret Wright for president. So she ran in the 1976 presidential campaign. She was part of the People's Party, which... Um, she was, she was really coming out of community organizing. Um, she was a community organizer in Los Angeles and in Watts. She was known to many people as, as Grandma Margaret. Um, she really believed in this larger kind of platform of social programs, redistribution of land and wealth and free health care. Um, her running mate was Dr. Benjamin Spock, who was a well-known American pediatrician. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor, she became a Rosie the Riveter and worked for Lockheed, where she got involved in the union and in political organizing. Um, she went on to found uh, Women Against Racism and the United Parents Council of Watts and was an organizer for several crucial protests, um, particularly to improve education and equity in education. So this project is dealing not just with American presidents, but American political influence outside of the U.S. and uh, electoral politics in Mexico and in the Philippines and presenting a more expansive view of political failure. I'm just going to talk briefly about the contribution from the artist Pio Abad, who is a London-based Filipino artist. Pio has made an ongoing body of work related to the political history of the Philippines. And for almost presidential, um, he's made a, a three panel work, a triptych engraved in marble. And the, uh, the title of the work is Thoughtful Gifts for. This is a letter engraved in marble that is from Rudy Giuliani to the attorney general's office in 1988. At the time, Giuliani was a federal prosecutor, uh, a really leading federal prosecutor who successfully uh, prosecuted the mob. And he's a, you know, Giuliani is a familiar name now as Trump's personal attorney. He himself is a failed presidential candidate. He ran in 2008 for the Republican nomination. Um, but this letter is about the indictment of Filipino President Ferdinand Marcos and his wife Melda on racketeering charges, massive, massive, massive theft of money and wealth from the Philippines. They were exiled in Hawaii at that time. They moved their money that they'd stolen from the Philippine government to the US and then continued their illegal activities here. 
And in this letter, Giuliani talks about a $6 million collection of fine art and antiques that was bought with money stolen from the government of the Philippines. Giuliani was quoted in the press at the time um, when pushing for the pros prosecution of the Marcoses. Uh, he said, no one is above the law, uh, which I think is an important uh, comment to think about in the context of Giuliani's uh, current role in American politics and international politics. Um, I'm also gonna read, since it's hard to see on screen, just a couple of lines from this letter where Giuliani is pushing for the Attorney General's office to prosecute Marcos's, although the president was reluctant to at the time. Um, so Giuliani says, they use the United States as their safe haven for this ill-gotten wealth that to fail to prosecute would give Marcos a protection against application of United States law enjoyed by no other person in our country, including the president of the United States. Even a former ally cannot be permitted to continue ongoing crimes. The use of marble in this work, and, and this is one of several letters that Pio uh, has produced in, in marble. Um, it presents this history not as an isolated narrative, but as a nexus of intertwined histories. And using marble, it's incontrovertible. There's a real permanence to this document. Um, the letter itself, uh, Pio found when doing research at the uh, Reagan Library and Museum here in California. And at the time he was looking at uh, gifts that were given by the Marcoses to the Reagans, many lavish gifts. The Marcoses were famous for a very, very lavish lifestyle. Um, and in fact, uh, Amelda Marcos, at, she returned to the Philippines and she was in the House of Representatives in the Philippines for four terms. And I believe it was only just last year that she uh, was actually successfully prosecuted on corruption charges. Um, so, you know, this idea of corruption and impunity that's at once a geopolitical and an allegorical matter um, is present in this work. And, and for Pio, the works uh, speak of both painful intimate histories and also imminent collective futures. Hi everyone, and thank you for having me today here. Uh, it's very exciting to be doing this kind of uh, project in the political context that we're at. So what you see on this photograph is Margarita Zavala de Calderón, and she is a wife of the former president Felipe Calderón in Mexico. The Felipe Calderón, he was president from 2006 to 2012, and Margarita and Felipe Calderón were, are both lawyers they both belong to the same party. The party uh, launched him as a president, as a candidate for presidency. And then when it was Margarita's turn to run, well, she was not chosen by the by her party. So that was like, that's something that started to be interesting for me, along with the seeing her um, speaking to publicly about her campaign. So what happened is that, uh, she, as I told you, like she sounds like a very capable person, but in the interviews and on the media and the press, they were always like pushing on the idea that she was never good enough and that she was always on the, um, always compared to her husband, Felipe Calderon, that uh, he was allegedly an alcoholic and also um, the war on drugs that he launched uh, resulted on millions of people disappear and killed in Mexico. So it was a very tough balance for Margarita to um, try to separate herself from her husband, but at the same time running a conservative platform. She's like, um, she's against abortion. So she wanted to be seen like a very pol political person and at the same time like family driven. So these are the ideas that I was, um, I wanted to touch on in the video. 
I wanted to also show how all the insecurities that she must have been feeling at the time and at the and the idea that as a woman she was never going to be seen as an individual but always being compared to her husband in the same way that other uh, female candidates in the United States might have been looked at like uh, Hillary Clinton. So the I'm going to present to you a little excerpt of the video and that's also available on my website and uh, in the project for this exhibition. Los ciudadanos están cansados de corrupción de instituciones que solo le responden a unos focos. Mucha gente se ha acercado a mí con la preocupación de que las cosas no van a cambiar. Pero juntos vamos a cambiar al país. ¿Te cae? A ver, a ver. Ese lenguaje de politiquería ni me gusta y si te puedo ser sincera, la verdad es que no me interesa saber más de lo que quieres y sin tapujos. Saber en lo que te puedo ayudar. A mí me estás pagando como tu guía. Entonces, de esa misma manera como en los United States tienen gurús budistas. Así que vamos a ser muy honestas y vamos a ver fuera la política. Vamos a ver, hablamos a la boca de cántaro. He visto tus mítines y sí, tienes mucha cola que te pisen, comadre. También tienes muchas inconsistencias en tu discurso. O a ver, ¿cómo le llaman eso en tus círculos? Yes, room of opportunity. Thank you. So that's a little bit of an excerpt. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about my piece of ephemera that I chose. It's also a Mexican candidate or sort of. So Marichuy was a candidate for many groups of indigenous people. And the reason why they chose her is because um, she represented their values. She's against like um, the neoliberalist um, agenda. The, she is pro um, having like more thresholds on mass media. And the, for example, the Zapatista movement uh, endorsed her. And one of the things that I, that she, that the reasons why she was not selected as a candidate, like she couldn't, she didn't run, she didn't run as a president is because she couldn't collect enough, enough signatures. So the political system in Mexico, you have to have digital signatures and because Mexico doesn't have the technology and the majority of people live in poverty, then she was not able to um, she, because a lot of the people that uh, vote that wanted to vote for her are in rural areas, so they couldn't uh, participate and get registered. One thing that we wanted to talk about um, during the first part of this kind of like discussion part of the of the panel is to talk a little bit about. Um, maybe a, a particular candidate, um, either the candidate that we researched that we added through the ephemera or the candidate that we made work about. Um, we want to talk a little bit about how that candidate might have gone on to influence uh, future elections that came after. I'm guessing that for many of you listening today, you probably don't know who many of these people are um, or maybe forgot about them or maybe just know some very tiny bit of anecdotal information. And so it's interesting, I think, to look back on them and, and hear those echoes in 2020 as, as we prepare for this really consequential election. And, and so, you know, I had talked about George Wallace and um, this is, I don't know how well you can see it, but this is actually a, a law and order George Wallace for president pin from his 1968 campaign. And I think that's a phrase that we're gonna just keep hearing more and more now. Um, and, you know, I think that the really uh, divisive and fear mongering rhetoric that he was famous for, um, especially on issues of race are, are hard to ignore right now. Um, and, and I guess I maybe just wanted to say something too about Hillary Clinton, which was where for me, my project actually started and thinking about, uh, I don't know if anyone remembers, but the day after the 2016 election, 
Hillary was spotted walking in the woods by herself and someone like posted something on Instagram of, of Hillary just out in her fleece jacket for a walk in the woods. And so thinking about the morning after this kind of hangover moment or an autopsy um, when the decision has been made and it's, it seems like that's the end but actually, as we maybe can talk about with some of these candidates, it's not really the end. And they do have an influence, be it a positive one or a negative one, on what happens in future elections and in, in politics and, and society. I think as, a, as an immigrant, like I can see the parallelisms between like Hillary Clinton and Margarita Zavala, even though I didn't vote for Margarita Zavala, but it was really interesting to see how as a woman, you can never be separated from the deeds of your husband as much as you try and another, um, interesting thing was that she was never allowed to be perceived as mad or to be too strong like strong towards the media and that's another thing that it was always criticized on hillary clinton and um uh, something that i hope that for the future is that the there that in our countries in latin american countries we have more or even in the U.S. that we have more influence of uh, indigenous peoples in the or more voices that are not just like men and Caucasian. As Marissa was talking, I was thinking more about um, uh, Eugene McCarthy, who I didn't know that much about until we started researching the ephemera. But I was thinking a lot also about um, and, and I guess the corollary on the other side would be George Wallace. But these candidates that that have almost, you know, maybe even have almost no chance, you know, that are, that are, or maybe they seem to have a chance at a moment, but they, since politics is kind of a zero sum game, they don't have the ability to garner a majority of, you know, 50% of the voters in order to, to, um, to become the, um, the candidate, but they, but they do force the candidate to take positions that they wouldn't have taken otherwise. So for example, I chose Eugene McCarthy because he, he was literally responsible for making Robert Kennedy take a position against the war and against the sitting Democratic president where he had made a political calculation that that might not be in his long-term interest. He didn't want to run against the, the sitting Democrat. Or we were talking a lot in our conversations leading up to this project about how Bernie Sanders has a similar function in today's election, right? He didn't, he, he's now run twice and hasn't succeeded in getting the nomination, but he's largely credited with relief for student loans and income inequality and um, health care for all on the ballot um, and made those mainstream Democrat positions. So I guess um, that was one of the, I was kind of curious how um, you guys are thinking about your failed candidate. And I, was, I know you talked about it a little, but, you know, um, affecting how we um, we think of the political universe and what's possible and what seemed outlandish in the past. And it could be a negative, like with Wallace, where the thing that seemed outlandish was this law and order racism that now is possible again. I know being an artist is a very subversive position and inevitably my work can be interpreted in one direction or another, but I do try to mimic the role of a historian and to not uh, use history to buttress my particular interpretation of the present moment. Although, you know, I'm dealing with war, so it's a very sensitive thing. But I think that, and I was just thinking about uh, what Deborah was saying about the role of a failed uh, contender and what that and how that could function now. I think that has shifted greatly in a way now. I'm not sure like the, uh, America always has to wrestle with its notion of winners and losers. And it's very, and it's becoming even more extreme. Since you all are interested in archives and do research and uncover materials, um, yet this, yet the materials are inherently political, you know, propaganda, um, let's say, um, or potentially. Um, so how is it that you, the question is from the person is, how do you develop a sense of truth for who they actually are and how do you move forward with that when maybe their values don't align with that that you believe in personally you know so how do you look at the icon the person the political figure but where do you invest yourself personally as an artist with concession i'm kind of physically taking on their personas um, but with the previous book project of mine called 13 presidents i wrote short stories um, with presidents as, as fictional characters in those stories. And 
um, and did have to try to humanize these public figures. For me, it comes out of doing a lot of archival research, factual research, trying to find moments of, of their voice or something more human about them, but then also infusing that with a lot of fiction and through my use of fiction, um, I feel like I have some better understanding of them. But in part, of course, I'm just inventing another version of these public figures. I think many of us sort of develop these, you know, parasocial relationships with the candidates and the histories that we're, that we're researching, um, where, where maybe I think an artist's role is also very different from, let's say, a historian's role, right? Where artists can look at historical material and um, we're not necessarily interested in just the kind of kind of factual elements about what has happened, but we are interested in the kind of impact that this has on um, sort of these larger questions about, you know, how, um, for example, I think I'm more interested in like how we, how we represent presidents in the US, how we bring those ideas into our homes and into our personal spaces about these kind of one-sided relationships that we have with these kind of ongoing mythologies that surround masculinity, particularly presidential masculinity, and almost the kind of like psychological effect that it has, um, you know, as we make choices about who to vote for, but also you know, as we think about um, forms of masculinity in the US. Um, and I think, you know, we have again, you know, thinking about the most recent debate, we have these, these two com competing, you know, even, even though I think many people would say gender is not maybe an aspect of this race, it actually is because we have two kind of competing forms of masculinity um, that, that are playing out on this national stage. And I think we, you know, we can look back to history and kind of think about how in the past these things have had an impact on elections and then also you know, think about different ways that we might even imagine moving forward. How, how would you guys think about, since you're dealing with political, you know, and social subjects, um, how would you think about, how would you think about the definitions between, you know, activism versus art or political propaganda versus, you know, the allegorical nature, you know, of our, you know, with, in terms of dealing with politics and, um, you know, social topics. Maybe this I, is a good moment, Deborah, for you to talk to us about 365 oh, Days yes. of Voters. Yeah. Oh yeah, this will just take two seconds. And actually that's kind of my answer to the question about how you deal with these historical figures mm -hmm. too, because in my work a lot, I've been trying to combine oral history and a kind of a vernacular oral history with my approach to these, you know, Nixon and Kennedy and other historical events by just bring up, you know, getting as many people as I can to tell me first person stories that are really not about who Kennedy and Nixon were, but more about who they are in relation to them and including, and so I think my work is not about who they were as much as how we're haunted by them and who they are in our heads. My current project that very, very quick, I just wanna invite you guys to be part of is called 365 Days of Voters and it's on Instagram, but you don't have to be on Instagram to be part of it. It's really just a platform for people to share their stories about why they vote or communities that they represent and then hopefully spread it through peer-to-peer -peer messaging on Instagram and other, other formats, some in, uh, printed things in various cities. But basically the way it works is you send me a, a photograph of yourself, it can be a selfie or a headshot through a, through a link, um, a, a, a secure Google form. I will make a drawing of you and um, you can do anything you want with the drawing. You, you can even have a signed print of it for free, just a laser print, but still for free. Um, and then um, I'll post you and hopefully you'll inspire other people to vote. So please check it out. And I, it would be my honor and pleasure to draw you and, um, and hopefully include your voices in the conversation about how we can make a difference this election.